And right now I'm going to, to invite uh, Pradeep, the CEO of uh, SolveCare to, to kickstart his presentation. Hello. Hello and Hello. good afternoon. Well, welcome and the stage is all yours. Thank you, Alex. And everyone who just finished presenting, it was very informative and useful. So I enjoyed hearing you all discuss it. And while healthcare is not automotive, there are a lot of similarities that I found in what you were discussing. So thank you for a great session. So let me uh, introduce a bit about who we are and why I'm here. Because I think that a lot of what is being discussed today in this conference and yesterday is, um, is really fundamental to our future as individuals and as humanity. And I do think that the last statement that was made, I believe Peter made it, that we want to be in a position where few highly talented individuals do not have undue leverage on our ability to be successful and safe in life. I come from the healthcare industry. Um, we all, of course, are somehow or the other connected to healthcare. We are born into it, and typically our last days are in the arms of healthcare. Um, but I've had deeper exposure to healthcare than most people, and that may be a good or a bad thing, but it is what's defined my life and my mission. Um, over the years, um, I've had the privilege of working in various government administrations going back to in the US, uh, going back to President Bush and Obama. Um, and helping implement some really large scale healthcare solutions that are still in use and affect millions of people every day. And I think in a positive way. I've um, built a few healthcare IT companies along the way, primarily focused on, on benefit administration, payment administration, care coordination, disease management, and things like this, provider network management, all the boring plumbing of healthcare that no one sees but keeps healthcare running. And along the ways, I saw a lot of things that, I, that troubled me. And then as a, a human being, we all encounter health issues and calamities in our life. And I have had my share. Uh, my father passed away from diabetes complications when I was very young. I lost a cousin to suicide. I have many medical practitioners in my family who practice medicine and complain about their inability to take care of patients properly. And of course, we all are in one way, shape or form, users of healthcare, including my kids who, one of them requires a lot of healthcare. So healthcare has been in and out of, I've been very much involved in this space. Uh, five, eight, four and a half years ago, I started SolveCare because having been an insurance executive, I realized that a lot of what we do is not really benefiting the patient and is not facilitating care in any way. And instead of just repeating myself for the next 25 years, uh, having spent the last 25 years in helping improve healthcare and in finding some fundamental issues, I decided that it's time to leverage a new approach. Blockchain wasn't on my mind, to be honest, back then, but it became a key strategy for us as we moved forward, as we realized some unique capabilities and properties of it. So today I'm going to share with you what SaltCare has done to really what we believe democratize healthcare uh, and how to bring access, affordability, and better quality of care to people around the world. And it's on the, on the framework of the SolveCare platform. So for those of you who don't spend their day in healthcare, I wanna actually talk, step back and say consumers. As a consumer, we are all used to having other people hold our data, be it credit card companies, be it insurance companies, be it hospitals, be it retailers or, um, public service organizations like the healthcare agencies of every country. But if you look at, you know, is our trust in them protecting our data well-founded? I think it's only a small sampling of how many ways critical information about us, our families, our healthcare, our finances is easily and frequently stolen. And recently the Irish Health Service um, had 4.9 million of its patient information Hack, which caused the entire health service to shut down. Um, and the rest of them you are probably familiar with, but what's really interesting is that there's a certain frequency and predictability to this data being aggregated and then being leveraged for the wrong reasons by someone with authority or without authority. So even when we share data with, uh, with people who have the authority to use it, it's not always clear that they use this data to our best interest. 
And why is data so valuable? Because data gives them control over decisions and those decisions lead to profitable outcomes for the data owner. The problem is typically the data user is not the data owner, right? But particularly in healthcare. So healthcare is a really funny picture where as a patient, my information is with an insurance company or with a government agency or with my employer who sponsors my benefits or with my doctor or with the hospital or with third party institutions that uh, have at some point in time provided me healthcare. But I have zero visibility into who is holding what information about me and how they're using it. And this data then is used to determine who I can see for care, what treatment I can get, how much I should pay, how much somebody else should pay. And interestingly, neither HIPAA, which is the equivalent of GDPR in healthcare in the United States, High Trust, which is another app or high tech, and GDPR itself, they really do nothing to give me actual visibility or control over use of data. And frankly, the right to be forgotten does absolutely nothing. If I am an insurance policy holder with an insurance company, my right to be forgotten does not extend to the insurance company deleting my records because I was a customer and they will never delete that record because they need that for their own legal and compliance reasons. So right to forgotten has almost no purpose or value in healthcare, which means that once you give the data to any of these entities and they require this data to be collected before they'll provide you necessary healthcare services, you basically as a consumer have zero control. Neither the US law nor the GDPR nor any other government on the planet has yet empowered the patient in terms of control over their data. And that is a big problem. It may seem like an esoteric problem. It may be an okay trade-off in the minds of the patient, me included, when we need healthcare to have to trade control over our data and privacy and identity for getting care. Well, when your kid is sick, the last thing you're gonna negotiate is whether you have to sign the HIPAA form or not. When the doctor says, you want your kid to come to the hospital in the middle of the night, you have to give me HIPAA consent. You're gonna sign 55 consents and not one because you want your kid to be taken care of. So unfortunately, all these laws and rules are very easily uh, overcome in the interest of the institution because if the choice is between getting care and not getting care, you're always gonna go for getting care, even if you had to trade your privacy and your autonomy and your sovereignty. But it has huge implications in terms of cost. I'll show you a startling number here for those of you who don't know healthcare very closely. The world spends over $8,000 billion here in healthcare, about half of that gets spent in the US. But if you just take the US numbers and break them down, and I know that US is an anomaly, but it's not really that much of an anomaly. About out of $3,800 billion we spend on healthcare, we actually spend $1,300 billion of it in not delivering healthcare, but managing data, interoperability, and payments. So essentially, for every dollar we spend in healthcare, we also spend about 40 cents in managing data sharing, consents, privacy. And funnily, despite spending this $1,300 billion a year on data and privacy, sovereignty, and coordination, Neither is healthcare well coordinated, nor is it private, nor do I have control over my information, and no, neither is there any single view of me anywhere that is helpful from a care perspective. So what are we really achieving? Nothing. What we are achieving is extremely episodic, expensive care. And the funny part is this problem isn't limited to just US, it's worldwide. And this is the problem that I think requires a rethink. Now, there are many, many, many versions of this picture. There are, if you do a Google search, consumer-centric healthcare, which is kind of the model in every country, in every government health policy, this will picture or some vision of this will show up. But it doesn't exist. There is not one country on the planet that has actually made the consumer the data hub, the owner of data, not one. They all talk about consumer-centric care with the assumption that this model somehow, which is consumer excluded care, will convert itself into this by writing another policy paper, another big you know, mission statement on the wall, and another speech by the health minister. Doesn't go anywhere. Why? Because we don't see the consumer as the actual owner of their data. We see the consumer 
as a recipient of care, but I have their data, you have their data, but Alex himself has no data that he actually can use to determine any healthcare decisions. And this is a problem that fundamentally defines the excessive cost and the general disenfranchisement of people from their healthcare delivery. Even in highly quality care countries where healthcare is accessible and easily available, and people are generally happy with their healthcare access, they still have zero control and they still have to trade their identity and their privacy and their, uh, and their uh, uh, ability to determine how their data will be used for getting care. So for the most part, if care is good quality, people live with that compromise, but that compromise drives a lot of inequity in healthcare. And if you look at what the pandemic has done, pandemic has proven my point, the point that I've been making for the last four years, that highly centralized healthcare systems will buckle under a demand supply inequity, whether it's socioeconomic inequity or it's pandemic driven inequity, you will not be able to deliver decentralized healthcare in a centralized care model and you will never ever empower the patient unless we treat the patient as a source of truth rather than a bystander and an and a accidental participant. To achieve this is very hard, okay? And many people will argue it's impossible. And the reason they'll argue it's impossible is because there are three fundamental issues here. Who owns the data? Who gets to use the data? And who pays for or monetizes this data? Those are fundamental issues. And today, around the world, in every industry, not just healthcare, custody of data equals ownership of data. And then let's use any of the social media companies. They have information about our behavior and our ethics and our, and our habits and our friends and our location. They actually don't own that data. The data belongs to you, but they have collected it. They have custody of it. Therefore, they use it. And there's very little we can or, or actually are able to do about it. So custody equals ownership, and that's not the way healthcare can or should operate. Custody should not equal ownership. Custody should only be custody. Use of data, regardless of who has custody of my data, should be still in my control. And that is a premise on which we have built a, a platform and an application framework using blockchain and tokenization uh, that tries to change this model, that inverts this control mechanism. So our vision and our strategy is to build a care wallet that is fully autonomous and sovereign, decentralized, encapsulated, containerized object, which is fully in the control of the patient. There is no central database or repository of the data that the patient has in their control, 100% owned by, but shareable and published by the patient or the consumer. And they have the ability to consent for this data to be used by a subscriber and or the ability to revoke that consent should they wish the subscriber to stop connecting to and receiving data from them. And to change the model where custody does not equal ownership. Ownership is ownership. I give you custody, but I also have from, by virtue of my ownership, revoke the custody of your data. That is our vision. And it is done with these four key components, a care vault where I store my data, care cards to which I share my data, uh, linked to an event, care ledger where I have an immutable log of everything that I was done so I can prove or disprove uh, any uh, assumptions about what happened and care circle where I can create a highly personalized social and or clinical sharing group where I can safely exchange the data. Could be my friends, could be my doctor, could be my employer, could be my insurance company, my government agency or none of the above or all of the above. So that's the model. And in doing so, we have built this product called Care Wallet that I want you to take a quick look at. And let me see if you can hear the sound. There's no sound right now. There's no sound. I had to figure out how to audio setting. Okay, well, I'll let it run without a sound um, because I'm not exactly sure how to, to make sound work in this particular version of Zoom. I can hear the sound, but I think you cannot. Uh, I think you, uh, I don't know exactly where that is, uh, where you have to uh, share the sound. Um, that's fine. I'll move forward not to spend too much time um, on the video. The idea of the care wallet, as you saw, if you did were able to follow along, was to have a care wallet holder 
be able to essentially control who subscribes to and what services they subscribe to. So it's essentially a publish subscribe model where I can, using my care wallet, join a variety of digital health networks on the software platform. These networks can be launched by my insurer, by my employer, by my community, by my church, by my government agency, by my pharmaceutical company or pharmacy network. But I choose what network I want to join and I can join as many networks I want. When I join the network, then the network subscribes to my wallet and essentially has access to data from in my wallet through care cards that I choose to share with my care network and vice versa. So the objective here is that I am the sole arbitrator and interoperability hub for my data. I have control over what data is shared with what network. And of course, if I choose not to share data with the network, the network probably cannot give me the services um, I want from them because certain information would be needed for a network to compute my diabetic risk, for example. But if I wish to leave the network, I take the data with me and the network retains no ability or memory of, um, of my identity or my care wallet. So we have found this balance between appropriate level of information sharing while maintaining absolute control over patient's identity and sovereignty. Um, and we also further made each network auditable by requiring the network be uh, network protocol, as we call it, the rules of the network are on the blockchain, which means that before I join a network, I can review and study the network protocol and decide if this is something that's valid. And of course, if I'm not a technical person or you're not expected to be, the protocol is meant to be verified and audited by third parties who can write their opinion and, uh, and uh, assessment of the network protocol. Could be a doctor, could be a pharmacist, could be um, a benefits broker, could be an independent government auditor who can say this network is compliant with the best practices of cancer care or diabetes care or suicide prevention model and so on and so forth. And we have built a number of networks in using that model. So moving forward, what we are really trying to do is to, uh, to take a platform approach to building digital decentralized health networks that can be easily configured, that are secure foundationally, where the network design does not violate the security, uh, where they are trusted because all networks run on the same model of care protocol, and they are actually usable from a single app regardless of the network specific logic and services. So we basically bridged the gap between a pure blockchain and a full application platform, which is needed to manage business logic and data and security and consents, auditability, and a cost-effective infrastructure to run it on. But to do so in a manner that no one controls the network singularly, not solve care, not the network publisher, not the network participant, which means that there is no one with the root access to the server. There is no one with the database access to uh, master login or password. There's no one who can scan my care wallet using any technology and figure out what data is in my wallet unless and until I share it with a card. So the vision is to build an event-based platform on which identity, consents, transactions, payments, and data interoperability are linked to tokenized events. So tokenized events can be used to exchange the relative relevant amount of identity, relevant amount of consent around a specific card to transact and exchange cards with each other, to exchange value using digital assets, and to allow for interoperability of data between networks and to track all that using token as the underlying mechanism. So using this model, we have built a variety of care networks, but this is how the care network looks from a bird's eye view perspective. A care network essentially is a blockchain that has a published care protocol which a certain sponsor published that protocol along with the network and participants join it using the care wallet. Those participant roles are defined in the protocol, could be patient, doctor, specialist, hospital, pharmacy, transportation, ambulance driver, a home care nurse, um, you know, physical therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. Healthcare is always a team sport, right? Healthcare is never a solo sport. And you can also create care circles with people you trust to engage them in your care management. And this network, given its uh, access to the care wallet, can then publish and consume care cards from your wallet. It um, reacts to events and publishes events that you have subscribed to or you have published. 
and it allows interoperability between participants using care tags, which is essentially a tagged event-based interoperability mechanism. So the idea is then that one care wallet in the hands of a patient will stay with them for the rest of their life. Why? Because I may be young and healthy at one point in life and I wanna join a you know, gym network or a sleep in you know, fitness network. But then as I get older, I had developed certain pre-chronic conditions. I wanna join a hospital network that deals with those conditions. And as I get uh, benefits from employers or from government agencies, I can participate in or leave those networks as my life events and my life needs change. But all the data from all these networks gets aggregated in my wallet. And my wallet is always with me and it is immutable and it is, um, it's uh, encrypted and only I have the keys. So no network has a complete picture of my information other than the information I shared or the network published. So given that, you know, this is the kind of networks we have built on the care wallet. This is a diabetes management network that we launched in partnership with Boringer Ingelheim where a patient and a care coordinator can safely exchange risk factors and work with each other to ensure that the patient who has chronic diabetic condition is able to manage their diabetes uh, by sharing the appropriate information and the care coordinator can work with the patient and with the physician as necessary to achieve a more timely and accurate behavior. And all this interaction that's happening in cards being exchanged with each other is a private peer-to-peer -peer communication where we are only exchanging information from each card to the other side that either side is explicitly consenting to be shared. And when I disconnect from this network, the only thing the network will remember is the interaction, nothing else about me, which allows me to essentially deal with very sensitive issues like uh, healthcare where privacy is even more important than normal healthcare conditions, be it uh, scenarios like, um, you know, alcohol addiction or drug abuse or, or victims of assault or domestic abuse or, um, you know, childhood diseases or debilitating scenarios where you have um, stigma attached to those conditions, even things like vaccination and pandemics. So these are all achievable by simply modifying the network design and the same care wallet will alter its behavior to connect with the network. I'm sorry, will connect to the network and will alter the behavior by downloading the right care cards and allowing those cards to be exchangeable and interoperable. Now, why did we build all this? You know, when I was a, a Blue Cross CIO and before that I was working in public sector programs like trying to implement Obamacare, I oversaw billions and billions invested in IT. I mean, literally, was part of projects that ran, whose cost tag ran into nine figures. And yet we never ever achieved actual uh, outcome that we were looking for, both in terms of adoption by the patients, by the doctors, both in terms of cost containment and, and care quality improvement and access improvement. All the five principles of healthcare improve quality of care, reduce uh, barriers to access, make healthcare more affordable, have more transparency on what should have done versus what did get done and pay for performance, not for episodes. These are the five principles that are universal around the world. Everybody recognizes they need to be done. Nobody's figured out how to do it. And that's essentially where we are positioning ourselves. Um, so our vision right now is to invite developers and partners and integrators who are interested in launching new digital health networks, be it an insurance organization, be it a government agency, be it an independent group of innovators who want to create uh, their own digital solution for a specific population, diabetes, cancer, pediatric care, mental health, pharmacy care, um, you know, home care, uh, suicide prevention, or uh, dealing with premature births. You, in whatever the scenario is, whatever the population need is, uh, the idea is to enable them with this platform to build and launch the network in their community that will serve their stakeholders the best. And our vision is that physicians can launch their own networks because physicians know best what the patient needs are. So can insurance companies, so can government agencies, so can people who wanna build decentralized finance solutions for healthcare. Uh, and certainly we are very keen to work with AI and VR developers to make healthcare more virtually accessible because virtualization of healthcare is clearly upon us. There is no doubt that we are not going back to the model of in-person in clinical care as the sole method of delivery. It's clear that 
digital health and virtual health is coming and coming very fast. And pandemic has accelerated that journey. And many of you who are working in AI VR, would, uh, we would be very interested in speaking with all of you. Little summary about SolveCare. We operate in 14 countries. We are open 24 seven. And my team is 120 people. And our vision is to bring a blockchain based platform and on, on top of it, the right care network to every part of the planet. And we are currently seeing uh, interest really across the spectrum from US to, to Australia. And uh, we are excited to be able to present to you all today because I know many of you are really great innovators who are listening or participating in this conference. And our hope is that we might stimulate some thought and some brilliant ideas that may yet change the world for the better, particularly when it comes to healthcare. This is my team. This is who we are. It's a very experienced team. We, I've assembled them painstakingly step by step so that we are dealing with a very um, a strong advisory board and leadership team that can truly make this platform global. Um, with that said, I welcome any questions. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. <laughs>